Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, and I'm so glad that you're here for another exciting study in God's Word. Now, as a reminder, over the last few weeks in the book of Numbers, we followed God's people as they complained, and they marched, and marched, and then complained some more. But today, as they prepare to enter the promised land, we get a glimpse of what our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, calls the abiding preciousness of Christ. Sounds wonderful, doesn't it? It's a great study, so why don't you quickly grab your Bible, hop aboard the Bible bus, and as you find your seat and get comfortable, Greg and I have got some great letters to share with you. And we do, Steve. The the testimonies that our fellow Bible bus riders send just never cease to amaze, because our God is always doing something fresh. Now, we have a wonderful letter we want to start with from Jody. It's it's long, but it's wonderful. I'll I'll start up, and then I'll have you jump in and, and finish it, okay? So Jody says this, I wanted to send a note of thanks and encouragement to the staff at TTB and share how the ministry continues to shape my daily thoughts and strengthen my Christian walk. Hmm. I was raised by atheist, alcoholic parents with little stability in my childhood and no faith foundation. I really struggled during my 20s. After a series of personal victories and deep failures, I realized something was missing. By the grace of God and the prayers and guidance of a few friends, a faithful aunt, and my paternal grandmother, I gave my life to Jesus Christ at the age of 29. Praise God. Mm. I got plugged into a great church and about 12 years ago started listening to an old CD my husband had on his shelf, a gift from a co-worker at the time wow. of Dr. J. Vernon McGee teaching on the book of Peter. <laughs> Why don't you pick this up, Steve? Yeah, that was the beginning of my travels on the Bible bus. I'm on my third trip now and continue to find deep comfort, peace, and understanding with every broadcast. Dr. McGee's sense of humor, deep understanding of the Bible, and ability to preach in a way that helps me to stand firm on God's truth brings me great comfort. Also, Greg and Steve are wonderful hosts. Well, thank you for that. Yes, thank you. It's evident that they are godly men clearly called to the mission of bringing the whole word to the whole world. Their conviction and passion for the broadcast is contagious. God gets all the glory for all good things in my life. Our family has had serious hardships and hurts like most families, but God's word reminds me nothing is new under the sun. God is sovereign. Jesus Christ, the only way, and the Bible, our perfect guidebook. Thank you for bringing truth to us daily. I will be a faithful listener and giver for life. Keep up the great work. God's word transforms lives, and TTB continues to transform lives across the globe. I will write again more often than once every 10 years. <laughs> thank oh, you, Jody. Yeah, thank you so much, and, and praise God. And thank you for your kind words about us. We, 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 uh, we didn't know we were going to be reading that about ourselves, but thank you for your kindness. We're just so grateful to be on the Bible bus yeah. with you. And, and I hope that also you're encouraged by the fact that Jody had a tough life, yeah. you know, and an upbringing, and yet Christ came into her life and changed her, and that new life is available to you as well. You can look at all the hardship in your past and really have that be a boat anchor that continues to tie you down, or you can turn to Christ, and he can, he can really change your life and change your focus. Yeah, I remember listening to Dr. McGee recently through the book of Leviticus, and he was emphasizing that anyone can come to Christ, you know, that anyone is free at any moment to turn to Christ. And I often, when I hear you, Steve, on the days that I'm not in the studio with you, and you invite people to turn to Christ, Mm. I, I often think, how many people will we meet in heaven just because we kept extending the invitation? Yeah. Yeah, that, what a wonderful day that'll be. Well, if you've been encouraged by Jody's letter, I'd encourage you to sign up for our World Prayer Team and pray for people like Jody and other people all over the world every day, Monday through Friday. Super easy. Go to ttb.org forward slash pray. Sign up. You'll get that daily email Monday through Friday. It takes just a minute to read it. 30 seconds to pray, and it'll just help you keep focused on what really matters in this life. It's certainly not what's in your inbox. It's not your phone. (laughs) It's what God is doing around the world, and you can be a part of it. Greg, why don't you pray for us? Father, your word is powerful. Your spirit moves in powerful ways, and lives are being changed. We praise you for that, and we ask you to keep us faithful, to keep doing what you want us to do, to get your whole word to the whole world. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now we are in this section of the book of Numbers. It's the last section where we see the new generation, the preparation that's being made for them to enter into the promised land. 
and we saw the census was made first of all, and then we found out woman was given a new position under the law, and a position that brought her equal with man in the law of inheritance. And then we saw last time, beginning in chapter 28, the law of the offerings. Now, I'm not going into all the detail here, but I marvel at it for the simple reason that God spent so much time with the details of these offerings. Very candidly, it's rather tedious, and especially in this day, since we do not offer bloody sacrifices, but my, how tedious it must have been, and how meticulous things had to be for the offering unto God. And why? Because that offering speaks of Christ. And God is emphasizing here, first of all, the sweet savor offerings, that which speaks of the person of Christ. Now, that burnt offering, all of it ascended up, and it's actually what God finds in Christ, what he sees there, and how precious he is to God. God is satisfied with what Christ did for us. And so God says here, my sacrifice made by fire for a sweet savor unto me. You see, it's what God thinks of Christ, and that's what's all important. And friends, he's satisfied with what Jesus did for us, and we should be satisfied. Now, let me read on, and you'll see what I mean by the details that are given here. Thou shalt say unto them, This is the offering made by fire, which ye shall offer unto the Lord, two lambs of the first year without spot day by day, for a continual burnt offering. You see that? Burnt offering speaks of Christ, who he is, that all ascended to him. And that is the aspect of this sacrifice that is all important. Now, again, all of this points to Christ, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Now, when we come to the 29th chapter, you'll find the details are given here about a sin offering. And these are the sacrifices that have to do with the work of Christ for us on the cross. Now, we've been over all of this ground before with much detail when we were in Leviticus, and so we want to take advantage of covering a great deal of ground here because we have coming up next the Gospel of John, and we want to give all the time we possibly can to that. Now, all of this has been fulfilled in Christ, and here in this offering, that is, there were two of them, the sin offering and the trespass offering, we find that, especially on the great day of atonement, it was the one holy day, one of the days that God gave to these people, and he gave several of these wonderful holy days. Every one of them was to be a time of rejoicing. None of them was to be a time of mourning except one, and that was the great day of atonement. And why? because that's the day that the sin offering is made, and the emphasis is put actually on the sin offering for that day. And all of these wonderful high holy days, the feast days, you see, God wanted his people to come before him with joy, and every one of them was that type of a feast with the exception of the great day of atonement. And he said, on that day, ye shall afflict your souls and an offering made by fire unto God. And that's back in Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. But over here in the 29th chapter of Numbers, verse 7, again he repeats this. He says, And ye shall have on the tenth day of this seventh month a holy convocation, and ye shall afflict your souls, and ye shall not do any work therein, but ye shall offer a burnt offering unto the Lord for a sweet savor, one young bullock, one ram, and seven lambs of the first year, they shall be unto you without blemish. But then you will notice that there is to be, verse 11, one kid of the goats for a sin offering, beside the sin offering of atonement. In other words, this day reminds them that they're sinners. And on that day, the sacrifice was made for sins of ignorance. That means Friends, you're a sinner, even if you don't know it, you're a sinner. And you and I paid close attention to the Word of God. We'd find out that we're sinners. We need a Savior. 
And that is the emphasis on this day. Sins of ignorance. You're a sinner whether you know it or not. And you need a sacrifice. You need Christ. You need a Savior that died for you and paid the penalty of your sins. But why mourn? Well, friends, sin is what's brought sorrow into this world. It's what brought the teardrop and the broken heart. Sin brought that into the world. God hates it, and I'm glad he hates it. And he's moving forward today undeviatingly, unhesitatingly, uncompromisingly against sin, and he intends to drive it out of his universe because God will not compromise with it at all. He'll not accept the white flag of truce. He intends to eliminate it, and I'm thankful for that. And it's sin that has robbed you and me of our relationship to God, our fellowship with him, and therefore it's an occasion for mourning. It is occasion. When was the last time that you heard anybody weep over their sins? When's the last time that you wept over your sins? Have you been before God, my friend, and wept over your sins because of the failure in your life and because of the fact that you're far from him and your coldness and indifference. My, how we need to confess that to him today. And I mean with genuine tears that this thing has separated us from God. God says it's not because God is high and we are low, or he's great and we're small, and he's infinite and we're finite, we're separated from him. He says, your sins have separated you from me. And that's the occasion for weeping. My, as you look back over your life, and I want to be very frank with you. You see, now I've retired as a pastor of a church. I was ordained to the ministry in about 1932, I guess it was. Now, that's a long time to be an active pastor. And I want to say this, not in the spirit of boasting, because I don't feel that way about it. But I look back on every pastor that I've had as a successful pastor as the world or as the church judges those things. There's always been an increase in attendance, increase in interest. People have been saved. Young people's work has always thrived and grown. Well, somebody says then that's something that causes you to rejoice. Let me make a confession to you. I don't rejoice. I look back and I see my failure, and I see it in a very glaring way. Don't misunderstand. I never went out and shot anybody. And I am not guilty of committing adultery. I did not commit any of these sins. But I failed my Savior so many times and in so many ways. And I confess that to him. I have been before him. And when I think of my life, of how I let these things come in and separate me in times when I needed that fellowship and wanted that fellowship, but I let these things come in. My friends, the occasion even to this day of mourning, for weeping, if you please. My, I tell you today, friends, our hearts ought to be moved. And this is what this passage of Scripture teaches us. My, these are two wonderful chapters, 28 and 29. All of the details speak of our Savior and how wonderful he is. He was the sweet saver offering. That's who he is. But he's the non-sweet saver offering. That's what he did. He was made sin for us who knew no sin. But I did, and I'm the sinner. He died in my stead that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And he took my place down here, and he's given me his place up there. And I say this reverently, but I want to say it, that if you are saved today, friends, you have as much right in heaven as Christ has. Did you know that? You have his right to be there. And if you don't have his right, you've got no business there. I have some bad news for you. You won't be there because you can only stand in him, accepted in the beloved. That's the way God receives us. And if you're in him, you just don't improve on that at all. How wonderful this is. Now, I come to chapter 30 as we're moving along. And we have here, very candidly, the law of vows in chapter 30. And they speak particularly as they refer to women. Now, we've seen that women have been given their rights. They can inherit. Women also have responsibilities. 
And we called attention in Leviticus. There's a whole chapter there on vows and the importance that God attaches to vows. And he tells the child of God that you better be careful if you're going to make a vow to God. He'll hold you to it. And don't make one foolishly. I think that there's a grave danger today in people promising the Lord too much. As I got to the end of my ministry, I became very reluctant to ask people to take any kind of a vow before God except to accept Christ as Savior. Why? Because I've seen multitudes come to an altar to dedicate their lives. And then, friends, before the week was gone, I've seen the lives of some of those individuals. And I'll be honest with you, the vow was broken. And God holds us to vows. Now, He didn't ask us to make some of them we make, but if you're going to make one to God, and remember, do business with him, because he'll hold you to it. Now let me read this here, beginning with verse 1 of chapter 30. And Moses spoke unto the heads of the tribes concerning the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. Now notice this. If a man vow a vow unto the Lord, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. Now, that is very important, and it's very important for Christians today. After all, what does Romans mean? What does Paul mean in Romans when he says that if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, how do you believe on him? Why, with your heart. What happens? Well, uh, confession is made by the mouth. And that's been a passage of Scripture that I think has been greatly abused a great deal today. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. And that's your vow. That's your statement of faith. And shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. The point of it is, It's not just what the mouth says, it's what the heart believes, friend. And he says they must be brought into agreement. For with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. Now, you don't believe with your mouth. You say it with your mouth. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So don't say it with your mouth until your heart is singing a duet with you. The mouth and the heart ought to have a duet. And they ought to be singing the same tune. That's exactly what he means about this matter of vows. Now the question is, what about women that make a vow? Listen to this. If a woman also vow a vow unto the Lord and bind herself by a bond being in her father's house in her youth, and her father hear her vow and a bond wherewith she hath bound her soul, and her father shall hold his peace at her, then all her vows shall stand. And every bond wherewith she hath bound her soul shall stand. In other words, if a woman makes a vow while she's still single in the home, the father can be held responsible for her, you see. Now, if he keeps quiet when he hears her make the vow, then that vow that she made is going to stand. Now, the father, though, can say, wait just a minute. She's bought this dress, and she's not able to pay for it, and I don't intend to pay for it. Then he's protected in that matter. Now, suppose the woman is a married woman. Well, verse 6, And if she had at all a husband, when she vowed or uttered aught out of her lips, wherewith she bound her soul, and her husband heard it, and he held his peace at her in the day that he heard it, then her vow shall stand, and her bonds wherewith she bound her soul shall stand. So that if the husband keeps quiet and says nothing when she buys an expensive dress, But if the husband at that time says, no, sir, I'll not pay for it, then he's not obligated and that vow will not stand. But you see, the vow the woman made, either the father or the husband, is held to it. But the husband can disallow it as well as the father. I think that here is a great step that is made that actually hasn't been made today. You know, a woman today and many of them that are gold diggers. They meet a man, and they marry him for money. That's true today, especially a young woman marrying an older man. She marries him for his money. 
And after she's got his name, she can pretty well go to court and get practically everything that he has. And I've seen that happen several times. I saw a Christian man, his wife died, and he got very lonely, and he married this woman. And she was really after his money, and he was a man of means. And he was a member of the church, and he had left money to certain Christian organizations, to several mission boards. Why, do you know that wife came in there and absolutely was able to break the wheel? And none of these organizations, and they were good organizations, were able to get a dime. Now, I personally think that that's entirely wrong today. And God, you see, made a rule that the husband could disallow it, and also the father could disallow it, and it would be impossible for a wife to sue a rich man and get everything he's got. It just wouldn't stand, unless he himself permitted it, of course. But many of them haven't been able to protect themselves at all. I've had in several cases where a man has told me, oh, this woman married me for my money. She got everything that I had. Well, that's the foolishness of mankind, you see. Somebody said God made women beautiful and dumb. He made them beautiful so men would marry them. He made them dumb so they'd marry the man. But they're not so dumb, friends. Some of them are very smart in this type of thing. Now, God says in verse 9, But every vow of a widow and of her that is divorced, wherewith they have bound their souls, shall stand against her. In other words, if she's a widow, she stands on her own two feet, and the vow that she makes will stand. It's quite interesting, these vows, how important they are to God. He wants his people always to be as good as their word because of the fact that Christ took an oath. Again and again, you find that in Scripture, that God took an oath. He took an oath to David, and God intends to make that good. Now, God made a contract, an oath. You'll recall to Abraham, and we find also the Lord Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, that's the word of God. His word stands, friends. He said he'd save you if you'd trust Christ. That dear little Scotch woman who told her unbelieving son went away to college, and he said, why, your soul don't amount to very much. Even if you lost it, you wouldn't lose much. And she thought it over and said, I agree with you. I wouldn't lose much. But if I lost my soul, then God would lose more than I would. And he wanted to know how that could be. He says, you admit that I'd only lose my soul. It doesn't amount to much. But if I do lose my soul, God will lose his reputation. Because he said he'd save me, and I trusted him. And I say, God will stand by his word. His oath is good. He doesn't have to take an oath. All he has to do is to say it, and it is true. And he wants those who represent him down here to be that kind of a people. Those who, when they make an oath, they stand by it. And that is the thing that should represent the Christian in this world. Now we come in chapter 31 to a battle that Israel fights here with Midian, and they get the victory. Midian were those folk way out yonder in the desert, and they actually represent the world. I think that we can say that quite accurately. And you have in the rest of this book, you have actually the last official acts of Moses. Now, when we get to Deuteronomy, we'll have the last private acts of Moses. But here are the last official acts of him. And one is the war that he carried against the Midianites and how God gave to them the battle and how important that was. Now, that's in chapter 31, and I see that our time is about up, and I'm not going to have time to go into that at all. We will begin there next time, and I'm not sure that we're going to be able to finish the book of Numbers next time, but we'll make the effort, and that means we'll be going then to the Gospel of John. Now, if you're a new listener, you do not have our notes and outlines, let me urge you, friends, to write in now for the notes and outlines that we supply on the Gospel of John. So until next time, may God richly bless you. 
If you want to get the notes and outlines for John, and it's a really good idea to do that, as well as our entire library of great Bible study resources, be sure to visit ttb.org forward slash resources. And remember, you can always call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. We'd love to help you out, especially if it deepens your study of God's Word yourself. I'm Steve Schwetz. See you next time on The Bible Bus. Jesus made it Through the Bible exists to take God's whole word to the whole world. And we invite you to stand with us with your faithful prayer and financial support. Where will God's word go today?